Radioactivity, according to present knowledge, must be regarded as the result of a process that lies wholly outside the sphere of known controllable forces. All these considerations point to the conclusion that the energy latent in the atom must be enormous compared to that rendered free in ordinary chemical change. Now, the radio elements differ in no way from the other elements in their chemical and physical behavior. On one hand, they resemble chemically the inactive prototypes in the periodic system very closely. And on the other hand, they possess no common chemical characteristics which could be associated with their radioactivity. Hence, there is no reason to assume that this enormous store of energy is possessed by the radio elements alone. These words, written in 1903, would presage the nuclear age by more than 40 years, and yet they were based on conclusions drawn from the experiments conducted by the greatest experimental physicist of the 20th century at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, near the end of the high Victorian age. This man would be the midwife who would birth a whole new branch of physics, nuclear physics, and oversee many of its greatest discoveries. It is his story we will consider here. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 2, A History of the Atom. Episode 12.1, Supplemental. Ernest Rutherford and the Birth of Nuclear Physics. Taking my cue from Richard Reeves' biography of Ernest Rutherford, our story starts at what some historians consider to be the high point of the Victorian era, the great exhibition in London's Hyde Park. Symbolized by the giant and absolutely stunning Crystal Palace, this exhibition put on display the fruits of both England's Industrial Revolution and its empire. The exhibition attracted more than six million visitors and turned a profit of 186,000 British pounds. While most of the money was used to create some of the great cultural sites of Victorian London, a small portion of the proceeds were used to establish a research scholarship meant to bring talented students from across the British Empire to study and do research in the mother country. While so seemingly small a thing, this scholarship would provide the resources to bring one young man from the very edge of nowhere to the center of learning and scholarship in Great Britain. Ernest Rutherford was born on New Zealand's South Island on August 30, 1871. The village south of the larger town Nelson was known as Spring Grove at the time of his birth, but when he renamed Bridgewater, which was how Rutherford always referred to it. For my American listeners, the town would look nothing so much as a frontier town in the inner mountain west with small wooden houses making up the village. The only difference would have been that rather than high desert, this part of New Zealand was green pasture land used for raising the sheep the islands are so famous for. Ernest's father was something of a handyman who could fix just about anything and a mill operator. His mother was a rigid educated woman who schooled her children from an early age and then sent them to schools in nearby larger towns, believing that their education was the key to success in life. Rutherford was a big kid full of energy and loud of speech. He played forward on the local rugby teams even while being a voracious reader. He was intellectually curious and deft with his hands. His mother recounted that he was the sort of lad to always take things apart to understand how they worked. The first science book he read was Balfour Stewart's Primer of Physics. Stewart was the professor of physics at Manchester University, the place where, in the same position, Rutherford would make some of his most remarkable discoveries 30 years later. As he progressed through the local schools, Ernest was always the best student, winning scholarships to attend the next level of education. It was through this process that he ended up at Canterbury College in Christchurch, 
where he completed his Bachelor of Arts degree in 1892 and his master's degrees in mathematics and science the following years. Finally, he earned a Bachelor of Sciences degree with firsts in chemistry and geology. While doing this, he continued to play rugby, lead the college's debating society, and doing anything the school offered, except perhaps dancing, which he never really mastered. While he was at Canterbury, Ernest's two brothers died in a boating accident, and his father moved the family to the North Island, likely as an attempt to ease the grief of his mother. Since the family was now a long ways away from the college, Ernest took up housing in one of Christ Church's boarding houses. It was there that he would meet Miss Mary Newton, the daughter of the landlady. Like Ernest's mother, Mary was a small but formidable woman who was well-read and played the piano. The two struck up a relationship, and Ernest asked her to marry him. However, as his only source of income was the small salary he earned by teaching high school classes, Mary turned him down, saying, That would be idiotic. You have to finish your education and decide what you want to do next. I would be a handicap. When he asked her if she would marry him later, her reply was, Of course I will. I wouldn't dream of marrying anyone else. Rutherford's master's degree work was in conducting electrical experiments to develop a wireless mechanism to capture Heinrich Hertz's recently discovered electromagnetic waves, or as they were then and are now called, radio waves. From journal articles, Rutherford was able to recreate Hertz's experiments and then extend them further by sending radio signals more than 60 feet through stone walls. He published his results in 1894 in the Transactions of the New Zealand Institute, where they attracted some attention as far away as London and Berlin. With these credentials to his name, Rutherford applied for the Exhibition of 1851 Research Fellowship in 1895. While another New Zealander, J.C. McLaurin, was initially chosen to receive the award, he decided to get married instead, and so it was offered to Rutherford. Borrowing money from his brother George, Ernest set off for England to see if he could make a name for himself or at least earn his doctorate and find a position that would allow him to wed Mary. With his scholarship of 150 pounds, he arrived in London with little more than some clothes and a box carrying his crude radio detection equipment and some letters of introduction. London's damp and sooty air did not agree with the man who had been raised in the country and soon he was taken with a bad cold neuralgia. However, as he had sent copies of his work to the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, then a short train ride from the center of London, he received a letter from the lab's new director, J.J. Thompson, inviting him to come and join the research being done there. In the letter, Thompson said, quote, I shall be very glad for you to work at the Cavendish, and I will give you all the assistance I can. If you could spare the time to come to Cambridge, I should be glad to talk matters over with you, unquote. Thus began one of the most fruitful partnerships in the history of science. The older Thompson was touched that Rutherford had traveled 1,200 miles to work with him, and Rutherford was deeply grateful that this brilliant Englishman had taken the risk of offering a country boy a job at one of England's premier scientific institutions. This is not to say, however, that this was an easy transition for Rutherford. He and a young Irishman by the name of J.S. Townsend were the first two colonials to be admitted to graduate studies at Cambridge who had actually not done their undergraduate work there. The young gentleman of England's aristocracy that occupied most of the positions at the Cavendish resented the two as it was thought that they had sort of cut in line to get their places rather than going through the formal English system. It was tough going at first for both men and not very comfortable but Rutherford and Townsend had something that the others didn't really seem to possess, an unending supply of energy and the tenacity and determination to succeed, whatever it took. Before long, the old Cambridge lads had their hands full trying to keep up with the two outsiders, and the smartest of those men put aside their enmity to begin working with the two. Less than two months after his arrival, Rutherford gave his first lecture to the research group at the lab, covering his continuing work in electromagnetic transmission and detection. At this point, I think it's important to describe Rutherford's personality, as so many of the stories about the man are incomplete without knowing something about the type of person he was. He was, 
for lack of a better description, a hearty country boy. His voice was loud, and he could be boisterous. He came to Cambridge with a strange, even bizarre accent that none of his fellows could trace. One habit Rutherford had, related by many of those who worked with him, was to sing, at the top of his lungs and way off key, the chorus to Onward Christian Soldiers, whenever he solved a tricky problem in the lab or made a discovery that pleased him. One of his classmates from the time, Henry Dale, described him in the following way, quote, open and friendly in his manner, simple and direct in his judgment of matters, unquote. In his biography, Reeves frequently likens Rutherford to that symbol of British naval power from the time, the battleship, which plowed forward, cutting through murky and choppy waters with little subtlety but great effect. The only true foreigner at, foreigner at the Cavendish at the time was French physicist Paul Langevin, who, when later asked if they had been friendly with Rutherford during his initial months in the lab, said, One can hardly speak of being friendly with a force of nature. That description notwithstanding, however, the two men would enjoy a long and beneficial relationship. As Rutherford integrated into the lab, Thompson was beginning the series of experiments that would lead to the discovery of the electron. While Rutherford was not part of this research directly, he was continuing his work on wireless communication. He was a spectator of what was being done and the methods and techniques of Thompson's approach. It was probably here that he saw firsthand the meticulous attention to detail and learned the tricks of the trade necessary to work with the systems that would serve him in good stead throughout his career. It was at around this time Rutherford made the decision to leave behind the wireless work he was doing. While some historians of science have argued that his work on wireless was ahead of that being done by both Marconi and Tesla, and that if he had continued his efforts, he would have likely succeeded in developing the technologies we now use today before those two, Ernest felt that the work was basically or essentially in the domain of engineering rather than that of science. He wanted to be on the cutting edge of research, and so he switched his pursuits to the new field of radioactivity at just about the same time as, the, as Marie Curie had. Thompson, who thought it that Rutherford's energy and ambition would allow him to boldly push into this new territory, had suggested the topic. Rutherford's initial work centered on looking at how x-rays affected the conductivity of gases, but he soon moved into studying the type of radiation in Becquerel's uranium samples. It was during this research that he was able to determine that there were at least two types of radiation that differed from x-rays being emitted by these uranium samples. As this discovery was being made and communicated, the next big change in Rutherford's life took place. By this time, the Cavendish lab had become known, under Thompson's leadership, as the place where the best scientists were being trained. As such, when a university needed to find a new person to fill a position, they often sought out Thompson's recommendation, especially if that institution was in the British Empire. Such was the case in 1899, when McGill University in Montreal needed to fill a new position, a chair in experimental physics, something that was new to many places. At that time, most schools didn't have faculty positions in physics as much as in natural philosophy, and very few spent resources creating positions specifically in experimental physics. Yet, McGill, which had just received a very generous gift from the tobacco magnate William MacDonald, had built what was one of the most advanced science buildings in the world and wanted an experimental physicist who could make the most of it. Thompson, without hesitation, recommended Rutherford. In his letter of recommendation, Thompson said, quote, I have never seen a student with more enthusiasm or ability for original research than Mr. Rutherford, unquote. While Rutherford was, at first, hesitant to take the position, he soon realized that he would have a chance to establish a reputation away from the elitists at Cambridge who never let him forget his frontier roots. And so Ernest left the Cavendish. It would be 20 years before he would formally return to the lab, and in the interim, he would invent the field of nuclear physics. <music> At McGill, Rutherford continued his research in radioactivity. 
It was during the first couple of years that he made the acquaintance of Frederick Soddy, who was working as a demonstrator in the chemistry department at McGill. The collaboration started off as a debate about whether the atom was indivisible, with Soddy taking the position that it was, and Rutherford arguing for the existence of bodies smaller than the atom. Before long, however, Soddy recognized the truth of Rutherford's position and was, in turn, invited by Rutherford to join in the research. Before long, the two were making huge strides in understanding the behavior of radioactive systems. Their first work was to establish that the rate of radioactive emission was not affected by temperature or humidity. This meant that the source of the activity was not to be found in chemical reactions, but in something associated with the atom itself. Following this, they measured the speed and mass of the types of radiation being emitted from various samples and dubbed three types of emissions as alpha, beta, and gamma rays, respectively. The alpha rays were massive, fast-moving particles that were positively charged. Beta rays were lightweight particles that were negatively charged, and gamma rays were uncharged particles that seemed to be able to penetrate almost any substance. Next, they were able to determine that the rate of activity of a sample was not constant, but would decrease over time. This was established by working with a gaseous emanation from the element thorium that was later identified as an isotope of the element radon. The two men were able to show that the rate of activity of this gas would diminish in a geometric fashion over time. What they found was that in a given amount of time, 11 and a half minutes in this case, the activity would decrease by one half of its original value. That amount would then decrease by another half in the same amount of time, and so on. This decay of activity could be modeled with a very specific and well understood mathematical function, and the time it took for the decay rate to decrease by one half was called the half-life of the material. The two men worked together from 1900 till about 1903, publishing 19 papers during that time. In 1902, the two put out an article titled Theory of Atomic Disintegration that gathered together all of their research to that date and made a clear case that radiation emissions had to be coming from inside the atom itself. The experimental work done by Rutherford and Soddy during this time was brilliant in its elegance and simplicity. The equipment used to make these discoveries was surprisingly compact, fitting for the most part on a single tabletop with some of it even being small enough to be held by hand. Much of that equipment can still be seen in room 101 of the Rutherford building on McGill's campus. In our age, where experiments in particle physics are being done in superconducting super colliders that run for miles underground, the idea that these two researchers were able to begin to pry open the atom with equipment that would fit in just one room, much less on a desk, is rather remarkable. Rutherford, during this time, was producing a stunning amount of work. One of his colleagues at McGill, a classics professor by the name of McNaughton, who usually likens scientists to plumbers, attended one of Rutherford's demonstrations at around this time. His description is telling of Rutherford's disposition. He wrote, quote, We paid our visit to the Physical Society. We found that we had stumbled upon one of Dr. Rutherford's brilliant demonstrations of radium. It was indeed an eye-opener. The lecturer himself seemed like a large piece of the expensive and marvelous substance he was describing. Radioactive is the one sufficient term to characterize the total impression made upon us by his personality. Emanations of light and energy, swift and penetrating, cathode rays strong enough to pierce a brick wall, or the head of a literature professor, appeared to sparkle and corsicate from him all over in sheaves. Here was the rarest and most refreshing spectacle, the pure ardor of the chase, a man possessed by a noble work and altogether happy in it." Unquote. British science writer and Rutherford biographer David Wilson wrote, quote, A problem, often an anomalous result, is seized upon. It is worried by that rather slow but very powerful mind until an answer emerges. And then, in a furious burst of laboratory work, the man who all acknowledge to be the greatest experimental scientist of the century eliminates every other possible explanation and rams his intuition down the throats of every other scientist by irrefutable evidence. The London Times would describe his process in this way. 
quote, Rutherford was great rather than clever. His intellectual machinery was not dazzling. He made no first impression of subtlety, but rather of intense enthusiasm. His well-built but seemingly not exceptional intellect appeared as if brilliantly illuminated by a tremendous inner light. His colleagues were startled by the brilliant illumination of the ideas of his mind, by the pervading clarity and light." Unquote. Finally, from the Manchester Guardian, an impression of what it was like to read his reports of his work. Quote, Beautiful experiments revealing matters of principle follow one another wondrously, and the reader says to himself, well, that was brilliantly done. It must be his finest. Then on the next half page, there is another of an entirely different kind, equally good. The procession continues, page after page, experiments, any of which would have been sufficient to cause the maker to be noticed and approved in the history of physics. The simplicity of conception, the cleanliness and rapidity of execution were characteristics of Rutherford's experiments. He seemed almost unable to make mistakes." Unquote. During this time, Rutherford was both in competition and collaboration with the other great physicists working on radioactivity, Becquerel and the Curies. There were scientific disagreements, such as when Pierre Curie suggested that radioactivity came from the environment around the atom, instead of Rutherford's supposition that it came from the atom itself. But they were always carried out in a collegial way. By the way, eventually, after re repeating Rutherford and Soddy's experiments, Curie came around to their view of what was happening. After the publication of Theory of Atomic Disintegration, Rutherford became a much sought after speaker at the conferences in Europe. He visited Paris in the summer of 1903, and he gave the Royal Society's prestigious Beccarian lecture during the summer of 1904. Accompanying him on these trips was his new wife, Mary, whom he had finally been able to marry in 1901 due to a steady salary and good prospects. While Saudi left McGill in 1903, Rutherford had begun to make the University of Mecca for those wishing to do research in physics. In 1905, he would be joined by the future Nobel Prize laureate Otto Hahn for a year. Also, during this time, he was recruited by a number of other North American institutions, including Yale, Columbia, and Stanford. However, as Rutherford longed to return to Europe, which is where the center of the action was, he declined all offers until one came from John Dalton's old university, Manchester. In January of 1907, Rutherford accepted the chair of physics there and returned to England to take up even deeper investigations into the nature of matter. Upon arriving at Manchester, Rutherford inherited an excellent team of researchers and technicians, including Hans Geiger and perhaps the world's foremost glassblower, Otto Bombach. It would be Bombach who would make possible many of Rutherford's discoveries over the next decade with his deft touch and remarkable ability to produce the thinnest of glass vessels which could be evacuated and not shatter. This team would quickly learn that Rutherford was a man of strong drive and occasionally mercurial temperament, prone to outbursts of anger when things went wrong and loud expressions of joy when things were going well. His saving grace was that he never stayed mad for long and when he had behaved badly, he was quick to offer an apology and then invest time in a person in their work. He was doggedly loyal to those with whom he worked and they thrived under his supervision. Eleven of the men who worked under Rutherford or with Rutherford would go on to win the Nobel Prize. Another, a chemist by the name of Chaim Weissman, would eventually go on to become Israel's first president. We'll have more to say about that relationship in the next episode. Shortly after arriving at Manchester, Rutherford put Bombach's talents to good use in the attempt to determine what the alpha particle really was. It had been determined that beta particles were electrons, but the alpha was still a mystery. Rutherford had a suspicion that they were helium atoms but he needed to trap them so he could find out. To do this, he had Bombach craft a glass cylinder with walls as thin as possible, about one one hundredth of a millimeter thick, or 10 microns. This was then placed inside a second glass vessel with thicker walls. The inner cylinder's walls were thin enough to allow for the passage of alpha particles from the sample of material placed inside that first cylinder, 
but the walls of the outer cylinder were thick enough not to let him pass through that one. Rutherford filled the inner cylinder with radioactive radon gas, that substance the Curies had discovered was emitted from radium, and then created a vacuum in the outer cylinder. Rutherford waited six days until the radon had all undergone radioactive decay and thus filled the outer cylinder with alpha particles. He then ran an electric current through the gas of alpha particles in the outer tube and found that the spectrum produced by this emission matched that of helium. The results of this work were published in late 1907. At almost the same time, Rutherford received word that he had been selected to receive the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the work he had done at McGill with Saudi. The fact that the prize was in chemistry was a source of great amusement for Rutherford, who always viewed himself as a physicist. In his acceptance speech, he joked that the committee had performed an alchemical instantaneous transformation of him from a physicist to a chemist. In the same speech, he revealed what he and Geiger had discovered about the alpha particle. Not only was it a helium atom, but that it was doubly ionized, or in other words, carried a positive charge of two. Shortly after this, Rutherford and Geiger took up the investigations that would lead to the discovery of the nucleus. As I've already covered that in some detail in the root episode, I will summarize in saying that between 1908 and 1911, Rutherford's team, including now the undergraduate student Ernst Marsden, would do a series of alpha particle scattering experiments that would show that all of the present models of the atom, most notably of that of Thomson, were an error and that the atom seemed to consist of a very small and dense positively charged nucleus being orbited by a number of electrons so that the whole arrangement was neutral. How this could be stable was unexplained, but the experimental evidence was pretty clear. Once published, the praise for the results poured in from many sources. Arthur Eddington, the man who would provide the observational evidence that confirmed many of Einstein's ideas in relativity theory, said that Rutherford's discovery was the most important advance in science since the ideas of Democritus. Hantara Nagaoka wrote, Congratulations on the simpleness of your apparatus you employ and the brilliant results you obtain. Still, as I mentioned in the last episode, the model had problems, not the least of which was that of stability. In this, however, the fortuitous hand of fate was about to intervene. Down in Cambridge at the Cavendish Lab was a young Danish physicist from the University of Copenhagen who was doing a year-long postdoctoral fellowship with Thompson's group. As the young man was a theorist, the strong experimental focus of the work being done at the Cavendish didn't seem to require a man of his talents. At the end of 1911, Rutherford attended the annual Christmas dinner at the Cavendish and gave the keynote address. While the focus of the evening was always merrymaking, the young Dane, one Niels Bohr, was enormously impressed and inspired by Rutherford's talk and soon packed up and headed to Manchester to finish his fellowship. The two men hit it off famously, and Bohr became something of a surrogate son to Rutherford, who only had a single daughter. The two would remain lifelong collaborators, even though Rutherford usually was dismissive of the work of his theorists. In Bohr, he saw the obvious brilliance that remained tied to the physical world and its suppositions. Working with Rutherford's nuclear model, Bohr was able to show how it could be stable by a combination of both classical ideas of rotational motion and the newer quantum mechanical ideas first pioneered by Max Planck. I'll have a great deal to say about Bohr's work in a future episode, so I'll leave it to say that Bohr published his modification of Rutherford's model in 1913 after returning to Copenhagen and in doing so was able to explain a number of outstanding issues in physics and thus take a huge leap forward in developing our understanding of matter. This story, I think, illustrates one other skill Rutherford had. Of all the scientific figures I have studied over the years, I don't think there's a single one who approaches Rutherford's ability to identify and develop talented individuals. Beginning with Soddy, and then following with Geiger and Marsden, and now with Bohr, Rutherford had worked directly with more truly gifted investigators in 10 years than most researchers will see in a lifetime. And as we'll see, 
he will not be done, not by a long shot. Rutherford would say of the time, in comments he made later to Geiger, quote, Those were happy days at Manchester. We wrought better than we knew, unquote. One of the boys, as Rutherford's Manchester group came to be called, Edward Neville, wrote, quote, It was utopia, really, with the professor in closest touch with all of his research men who, with little thought of their future living, were eagerly engaging themselves in obtaining results that seemed remote from any possible application, unquote. Among the group were Yale's B.B. Boltwood, George von Hevesy of Hungary, Casimir Fajans of Poland, Marcus Oliphant of Australia, and a cadre of Englishmen, including Charles G. Darwin, the mathematical prodigy and grandson of the great biologist, James K Chadwick, and Jeffreys Mosley. Both Mosley and Chadwick would play pivotal roles in the understanding of the nature of the atom. Nineteen fourteen would be a pivotal year for the group at Manchester and Rutherford personally. It began with the professor being knighted on New Year's Day and continued with the publication of Mosley's work on atomic numbers. While Mosley was an old fashioned British elitist who was, quote, disgusted to find large portions of colored students, quote, unquote, working at Manchester, and who regarded Rutherford as, quote, the son of a flax farmer who possessed neither languages or culture, unquote. He was as brilliant as they come. He was the only one of the group, in fact, who was able to force Rutherford to publicly admit a mistake, something Rutherford did in 1912 on a paper on the origins of beta rays. In late 1913 and in 1914, Mosley followed up on Rutherford's hunches and was able to establish experimentally the law of atomic numbers. While he was working with Vandenbroek's initial ideas, Mosley's ingenious experimental apparatus using X-rays established the relationship without question and began to give insight into what the structure of the nucleus might be. All of this, and so much more, was to come to an end, however. While Mosley and Rutherford were traveling in Australia to give a series of lectures, World War I broke out. Mosley immediately joined the British Expeditionary Forces as a lieutenant in the Royal Engineers. As a signal officer in the 38th Brigade, 13th Infantry Division, he took part in the Gallipoli invasion in August of 1915 and was killed by a single shot to the head. His will left all of his wealth, some 2,700 pounds, quote, to be applied to the furtherance of experimental research in pathology, physics, physiology, chemistry, or other branches of science but not in pure mathematics, astronomy, or any branch of science which aims at merely describing, cataloging, or systematizing." Mosley was not the only one affected by the war. Geiger, who in 1912 had returned to Germany to assume the leadership of the physical-technical Reichsanstalt in Berlin, was conscripted into the German military as an artillery officer and was wounded. James Chadwick was interned in a British prison camp after he was trapped in Germany at the outset of the war as a citizen of an enemy nation. He was held for three years, living in a converted horse stall with five others and suffering malnutrition as the Allied blockade of Germany slowly cut off food supplies. Ever the scientist, Chadwick still managed to set up a makeshift laboratory in the stall with some equipment Geiger was able to smuggle into him. He worked with samples of German toothpaste that contained traces of radioactive thorium as a whitening agent. On the other side of the conflict, Bombach, a German nationalist, was jailed in England for his views. Rutherford, too, was profoundly affected by the Great War. As the war persisted beyond the insanely rosy predictions of the troops being home by Christmas of 1914, Britain began to mobilize large numbers of young men and all of its institutional resources. This included enlisting in its scientific community to develop new ways to prosecute the war and new technologies to thwart the attempts of the central powers to disrupt the operations of the nations of the Entente. Nowhere was this more true in, than in submarine warfare, which threatened to destroy England's ability to sustain its war effort. Rutherford was drafted to lead the Royal Navy's anti-submarine division, though the Navy strongly resisted any interference from individuals outside its close fraternity. 
with little support or resources, Rutherford nevertheless was able to develop what was known by the British as ASDIC, but would be better known by its American acronym, SONAR. For a six-month stretch, Rutherford worked without taking a single day off, and even though, due to England having heavily classified the research a secret, the French, namely in the person of Paul Langevin, are credited with having developed the technology, it is clear that Rutherford had accomplished the same results with much less to work with. Beyond this, Rutherford also developed protocols for undersea warfare that remain largely, largely unchanged today and established the scientific and corporate infrastructure that would result in the British development of radar prior to World War II. By 1917, however, Rutherford's war involvement drew to a close. The combination of exhaustingly hard work, the unwillingness of the Navy to provide resources, and a specific unsolved problem sent Ernest back to his lab in Manchester. It is during this time that Rutherford would set the stage for what might just be the second greatest act in science ever. However, as we're only halfway through the biography, and I'd really like to avoid turning this into a Dan Carlin-esque epic, we'll wait to conclude our examination of Rutherford until the next episode. Before I go, let me acknowledge again the primary source for this episode. Richard Reeve's book, A Force of Nature, The Frontier Genius of Ernest Rutherford, has been a fantastic resource. While the book is a bit light on the specifics of Rutherford's scientific work, I find that it captures the spirit of the man tremendously well. If you're looking for a non-technical and accessible biography of Rutherford's life, I heartily recommend it. It's a wonderful and fast read that will give you insight into how we came into the atomic age of the 1940s and beyond. So until next time, full sails on your journey.